That night after supper, I had unaccustomed leisure time. For the past few years, when I had finished my evening meal, I'd usually be busy preparing my camp for the night. If I was lucky, I might get to sit around a campfire for an hour stewing in my thoughts while drinking before heading into my tent to sleep. Now I actually had some entertainment options. I was surprised that the urge to drink was missing. The machine had mentioned an intoxicant inhibitor. That must have worked. I wondered how long it would last or if I would need one again. Could it be that simply being in my familiar home again was enough to change my habits? I had my doubts, and I was not sure I wanted to be inhibited. There was a tablet sitting next to my Morris chair, which would allow me to access almost every written work ever digitized. I also had a wall-sized image screen if I wanted to watch videos. Those would include all of the archival videos from the former era plus modern works made by new humans. Even though Earth of the 32nd century lacked a contemporary version of Hollywood or Bollywood, there were still enough new humans who loved performing that new videos and movies were being created. Or I could forgo both of those ancient media formats and simply log into Conscientia. It would be a compromise experience, though, as I still had an older-style implant and cranial web in this shell. That meant I could only access the fringes of the all, unlike most new humans who utilized more contemporary shells which allowed the Conscientia experience to be virtually indistinguishable from reality. I decided to not log in. I'd been out of the loop, so to speak, as far as mingling with the planetary conscience for almost a decade, and it could wait a bit longer. Instead, I did what I often did in the evening and simply checked and deleted the messages on my smartwatch. As I checked the list, I noticed right away that I lacked the daily messages from the Naomi AI. Apparently, it had suspended its eternal onslaught since I had cracked a few days ago and begged for its help. I found the expected random messages from strangers, along with the few from family and old friends. I had a dozen more belated birthday wishes, although after I checked the dates, I realized they were not actually belated. I had just not checked my mail since the night before my birthday. One contact message caught my eye. It was from Uxa Esperanza. She had been my partner for the first two decades after I had defeated the Master AI 180 years ago. We had even had two children together, twins, a boy and a girl. When they had both been tested, mature in their early teens and had gone off on their own, Ux and I had drifted apart. She had focused her attention more on science, the efforts to defend the planet and build the colony ships to the stars, while I concentrated on the growth of humanity and our new civilization. Still, we had remained good friends and even occasionally lovers when our paths had crossed, but we were not exclusive any longer. Hardly anyone was exclusive in this era of perfect health, near immortality, and endless opportunity. I had not heard from her in over 40 years. I wonder why she was messaging me now. I signaled the message to open and listen to her words. John, I am currently on Vesta and too far away for direct communication, so I will have to leave you this message. I have received word from Naomi that you are back. The way she talked was familiar, but she looked different than I remembered. She must have gotten a new shell. The one she was in now looked shorter than the taller ones she had preferred in the past. It also seemed a bit more mature and looked to be in its 30s or early 40s. As with most shells, it was still fit and attractive. Filtered genetics tended to provide the perfectly symmetrical features that were universally appealing. Its contact was a relief, as up until now no one, human or machine, has heard anything more than the most basic acknowledged meant messages from the AI for the past nine years. I sat up slightly when I heard that. Nine years ago had been when the AI and I had had our incident. Naomi had ceased communicating with everyone else. That was news to me. I do not know the details of what happened between you two, which caused you to distance yourself from both Naomi and the rest of humanity, or why the AI has not interacted as it had before with the other major AIs and their human partners. She paused speaking and looked like she was trying to figure out what to say next. Naomi did not reveal anything except to say that you are troubled and forbade her or any of her presences from interacting with you. All she will say is that something happened nine years ago and that it had been serious. She did say that there might now be a chance of reconciliation or re-engagement, at least on your part. Again, she paused. I thought over her statement. Reconcile? Did I want that? I would love to see you again, John. Maybe I could help you with whatever it is that you are going through. 
Also, nearly six years ago, Minervus observed something strange occurring out on the AAV at just the right distance. I would love to discuss the matter with you. It would be good to have you again up to speed on the threat we all face. Something had been detected on the assemblage approach vector? That got my attention. I had been out of touch for, for a long time, but the assemblage was still at least a century away. I concentrated, oh, well, yes, 112 years until they were due to pass through our solar system. Interesting. I also caught the way she worded her request. She was making a not-so-subtle implication that I had been shirking my duties. When your situation with the AI improves, we should meet. Ideally, I should remain here on Vesta. If you are up to it, please join me here as soon as you are able so we can discuss matters. Gynosium and Stellux have arranged for a torch to be waiting at Gateway Sigma for your use. That also caught my attention. Something was up. For a torch to be kept on standby, just on the off chance that I would decide to travel to the asteroid belt was telling. I will close the message by repeating that I am happy you are back in contact, both of you. Be well, John. As always, with love, Ux. Much to think about with that message. I browsed and deleted the remaining messages. Then I sat in my chair for a long while. I had spent the day avoiding thinking about the Neo-Bear incident which had happened the night before my birthday. I now spent some time trying to figure out why I had broken down in its aftermath. The actions that had happened on what I now thought of as a night of turmoil were certainly traumatic, but I had experienced many shocking and uncomfortable events while I had been a wandering nomad. Why had that night been different? Maybe the gruesome death of Adele Sol Chilean had finally tipped me past some breaking point. Maybe my mind had been ready for a change and that event triggered it. I yawned and saw that it was after 11 p.m. This was very late for me, so I made my way back to my bedroom and fell into a troubled sleep. The next day was a beautiful, late fall day and perfect for a short buggy trip. It was sunny, cool, and calm. The buggy mule handled the winding curves of the paved lake cabin trail perfectly. I had a smile on my face as I chirped the tires while taking the corners a bit faster than was probably prudent. It only took a few minutes to arrive at the parking area outside the lake cottage. Two deer ran off as I stopped. They must have been feeding or drinking near the water's edge. I went inside to check out the cabin's condition and, as expected, found that it was as well kept as the main house had been. The small refrigerator compartment in the kitchenette area was even stocked with an assortment of snacks and beverages. I decided that I would spend the night here and open the cabin's windows to let in some fresh airs. Back in the buggy, I first headed north around the end of the lake before turning west. I recalled from my flight yesterday that the stranger's camp had been located just north of the small stream that acted as the lake's outflow on its western end. Circumnavigating the lake to the north would mean that the buggy could avoid crossing that stream and the risk of getting stuck. I kept the buggy well away from the lake shore to avoid the trees and brush which grew near the water. The tall, dry grass on the gentle hills was easy for the buggy to navigate, but I kept my speed low because the thick grass also hid the occasionally large boulder or pothole. As I drove over the hilltops, I occasionally caught sight of the distant northern sentry pylons. These formed the northern portion of the ring of fixed sentinels. It occurred to me that the camp I was heading for was located just inside the western extent of sentry pylons. This meant that the AI had intentionally allowed the stranger to set up his camp there, and that he had probably done so to take advantage of the ring's protection. I looked forward to finding out what the guy was up to. With my slow progress, I estimated that it would take about an hour to reach the camp. The slow crawl gave my mind time to wander, and I found myself replaying Ux's message. It had been good to hear from her. Really? good. I found that I missed her company and advice. I was beginning to realize that I missed a lot of other things as well. Not having to struggle every day just to eat and survive had removed a great deal of the stress in my life. Now that that was gone, I found myself reconsidering my choices. I was halfway to the stranger's camp when I spotted movement off to the northwest. I stopped driving and retrieved a pair of enhancement goggles from the buggy storage cubby. Cranking up the magnification, I was able to see that the movement was the stranger on his Neo horse. He was dressed the same as he was yesterday and was carrying a short but sturdy wooden bow with an arrow knocked and ready. I watched as he took up a position just below the top of the low hill and waited. Scanning ahead of his position, 
I spotted an elk come trotting up out of a valley to the west. Following a short distance behind the elk was a pair of slow-moving quadruped mobile units. Each of the units was carrying one of the tall androids, which I had noticed yesterday. The stranger was on a hunting trip. The machines were assisting him and acting as pushers to force the elk into an ambush. It looked like he had positioned himself in the perfect spot. The elk was moving cautiously to keep ahead of the mobile units, but it was also clearly not running in panic. I realized that the deer and elk in this area had little to fear from man as they had probably never been hunted before. And as long as they stayed here, they were safe from the bears and wolves which were barred from the area by the automated sentry ring. The buckskin-dressed man carefully slipped off his neo horse and crept towards the edge of the ridge. The elk continued moving slowly in his direction and looked to pass by the man very close. A minute later it had approached to within a dozen yards of the hidden human. Suddenly the elk froze as it became aware of the threat ahead. The stranger rose up and quickly fired. A hit! The elk jumped as it was struck in the vitals region. It then recovered and ran off, stumbling occasionally as it headed off to the north. The leather-dressed stranger remained calm and patient as he retook his seat on his mount and waited for the quadruped units to reach his position. When they did, all three moved off to follow the elk at a very slow pace. The wounded animal must have been leaving a visible blood trail as they did not hesitate in choosing a direction. The arrow also could have had a tracker, but for some reason I doubted the man would use one. I was pleased to see that their slow pursuit would give the wounded animal time to slow down and bleed out gently. It might even lay down somewhere relatively nearby as it tired. The group disappeared over the hill. I debated if I should follow them in the buggy mule, but decided not to intrude. I might startle the elk or I might interrupt the quartering and processing of the carcass, which they would be eager to complete quickly. I decided to head back to my lake cabin and wait a while. Visiting the camp later in the afternoon would give the hunting party plenty of time to collect the elk and return to their camp. I let the buggy's autopilot handle the drive back to the cabin. It had accurately logged our progress through the tall grass and its internal guidance would allow us to travel much faster while avoiding the already detected hazards. Ten minutes later, I was pulling into the cabin's parking area. The fishing gear was in the cabin's storage cubby, just where it always had been kept. I spent the next few hours teasing and harassing fish from the end of the stone jetty. Casting the lure into the calm shaded waters of the lake brought back many wonderful memories of when I had done the same with my kids and grandkids. Or of the times I had simply sat on the jetty enjoying a beer while the little human tadpoles swam and frolicked in the water. It had been easy to be a watchful dad. Omu had been ever-present and was quick to wade in if one of the children began tempting fate. They had learned quickly, and there had been few accidents aside from those which had not been caused by intentional horseplay among themselves. I even remembered the small, sandy beach area where I had admired the woman who had shared this place with me. Uxa and later Hana had spent much time sunbathing on the beach. Of course, they had been nude as we had never needed or required swimsuits in this era of enlightenment. There had been other women who had spent time with me here over the decades. Some had been friends. A few had been my older history students. The memories drove home how long I had been wandering about without companionship. Even though this shell was in its sixties, it still had hormones and needs. A hard strike on my line brought me out of my daydreaming. I jerked the rod up and felt the power of a larger fish on the other end of the line. I did not want to keep anything I caught today so I had used a lure with barbless hooks for easy release. This meant that I had to keep firm pressure on the line at all times, at least until I had the fish landed and could claim a true catch. My catch turned out to be a nice six-pound pike. I led the tired fish over to the beach area where I could easily land it and tease the hooks out of its sharp, tooth-lined mouth. That had been fun. The large predator fish also explained why I had not gotten a bite until then. It had been patrolling the vicinity of the jetty and had been eating or scaring the smaller fish away. Later that afternoon, I reattempted my buggy expedition to the stranger's camp. I used the autopilot to quickly return to my previous stopping point and then continued onward much more slowly. Twenty minutes later, I crested a low hill and spotted the mystery camp just ahead. As I had expected, the stranger was busy with the androids as they processed the elk carcass. Using the imager, 
I observed that they were using a combination of old school knives and other tools, along with modern food storage vacuum bags, flash dryers, and chillers. I was curious about the reasons for all this work and began to drive down the hill. The androids noticed me first and informed the stranger of my approach. He had been busy cutting meat and stopped to see who was coming. He went to wash up as I pulled up near the camp and parked. I waved and approached the man. Closer, I noted he was tall and lean and had the long dark hair and dark complexion, typical of a Sioux Indian male. How? I said. He smiled at my greeting and replied, Hokahe. I was pretty sure that meant welcome, but decided not to push my luck. I'm afraid that's about all the Lakota I can remember. Can we speak in English? I asked Kust. He continued smiling as he answered, Of course. But can't your interface continue to translate? Well, I'm not using the translator functions right now. My greeting earlier was from memory. That news got his attention. He looked both confused and surprised for a moment. Finally, he exclaimed, Ah, of course. You are John Prime. Despite your having grown up in this area back before the reset, I was not sure if you had learned any of the native tongue. Still, I'm happy to meet you. I did not expect you to be in the area while I was here. Yes, I'm John Abrams. When I was young, I had met and worked with a few of the local Indian tribal members during my career, and I remembered some Lakota words. I even lived for a short time on one of the reservations a few hundred miles west of here, I explained to the stranger. He frowned for a bit at my words, probably listening to his augment translate miles to kilometers, or maybe explaining what a reservation was. His following pause was probably from their internal dialogue discussing why I was using Miles in the first place. I interrupted their discussion by asking his name. Oh, sorry, my name is Chelsea. Chelsea Iberia. He saw my brow furrow at that and added, Yes, it's a female name. I'm normally female. I'm just using this shell for this research reenactment. Ah, my guess was confirmed. I had wondered if it was something like that. I looked around the camp noting the mix of traditional gear and ultra-modern mechanization. It seems your reenactment is a bit loose on its authenticity, I commented. Chelsea looked a bit puzzled. Then he squinted at my eyes very closely. Oh, of course. You don't have interface irises. Um, do you have enhancement goggles? I did. Back in the buggy, I retrieved them and put them on. Do you mind if I adjust your goggle filters remotely? He asked. I indicated that he could and soon enough, the goggle view of the camp changed. Oh, I said as I looked around at the new scene. Instead of the few synthetic tents and other machines, I now stood in what looked like a real, honest-to-God, old-time Indian village. Chelsea appeared the same as before. Most of everything else now looked different, though. The androids looked like authentically dressed natives. I noted with a smirk that they were all females. The two neo-horses looked the same, but the quadrupeds now look like real horses also. The synthetic teepees now look to be made of authentic weathered buffalo hide and now had curls of smoke drifting out of their open vent flaps. I continued to inspect the camp. The elk meat, which had been processed by the chillers and dryers, now appeared to be drying on a large wooden rack by a smoking fire. What an amazing blend of the real and the simulated. I lifted the goggles a few times to compare the real view with the enhancement. This is impressive, I said to the woman. Yes, it solved a few problems. One was the lack of volunteers to spend a year with me in this simulation. Another was that the AI would not have allowed me to locate the camp near your historical home if my team was larger. Why did it allow you to set up here? I asked. The AI needed the local wildlife thinned out. My reenacted hunts solved that problem. I end up with plenty of food and all the surplus is sent off to specialty markets. I am also broadcasting the simulation on a historical sub-channel of Conscientia. Anyone who wishes can join the simulation virtually and experience the point of view from any of the androids. The fees from their subscriptions provide the scut, our money, I need to fund the program. I looked around and saw that all the androids were busy with their tasks and avoiding me completely. I suspected my AI monitor was actively preventing my visit from being shared on the public channels. How long do you plan on staying in the area? I asked Chelsea, then quickly added, Not that I am trying to get rid of you, I mean. Until spring. I'm both excited about spending the winter here and nervous. The broadcast audience will love the drama of a tough winter, though. 
I've got plenty of food and firewood already assembled. I looked where she pointed. Lifting the goggles, I saw that the firewood pile was actually a large thermal heat source. I saw heat exchanger lines already laid out, extending to each teepee. I smiled. Well, this sure is interesting. I'm not sure how long I will be at the homestead myself. I saw your camp yesterday when I flew over and wanted to come see what was going on, I said before pausing awkwardly. I suppose I had better return to my side of the lake. It was nice meeting you, Chelsea. Good luck to you and success in your program. I turned and got into the buggy. She had hesitated but now approached quickly. Wait, before you go, she paused a bit, looking nervous. Would you mind if I came over to your home area tomorrow? I am not allowed to go on any of your maintained grounds without an invite, and I've never taken the tour. I'd love to see your house and hear about it from you firsthand. She must have seen my expression because she quickly added, I'll not stay long or be a bother, I promise, and I'll leave the androids here. It will just be the two of us and we'll stay private. Do you think that would be okay? The earnest expression on the male shell she was wearing was almost cute. I thought about her request for a bit before deciding what the hell. It might be good for both of us. I guess that would be okay. Not too early, though. I'm spending the night at the cabin on the east end of the lake and won't be back to the main house until mid-morning. Around 10.30, then? She asked. Sure, I replied before giving her a final wave and starting the buggy on its way back to the cabin. With the expected cool evening, it would be great to light the wood stove and maybe read a book in the cabin's snug daybed. The next day, a bit after ten, I was back at my main house and waiting on the porch for Chelsea's arrival. I had returned an hour before and had gotten the buggy back into its storage spot in the museum barn. A quick shower and a change of clothes, and here I was, ready to play tour guide. The night at the cabin had been wonderful. The fresh air and gentle water noises had reminded me of my years of wandering. It was a good compromise between those free times and living with the modern conveniences and closed-in comfort of my house now. After I had woken, I found enough grub at the cabin for a nice breakfast of pancakes. Now while I waited, I was still full from the large breakfast. This morning was a bit colder, and the calm day from yesterday was gone. Instead, a brisk breeze was blowing from the east. I was wearing my hooded jacket despite sitting in a low-angled sunbeam. Soon enough, I heard the clop-clop of an approaching neo-horse on the paved road. I spotted Chelsea and her horse coming down the road which led to the field base to the west. I wondered if she had visited it on her way here, or if she had caught up with the road somewhere between my home and the base. I did note that it was considerate of her to take the long way around and to approach my house from the front. She waved when she saw me on the porch watching her. I saw that her male shell sat the Neo horse well as she spurred it into a faster trot once it had reached my gravel driveway. Chelsea detoured to the side lawn and dismounted, leaving the horse to nibble on the taller grass by the fence. I wondered about her not hobbling it in place before I remembered that it probably had its own controller implant, which my guests could access remotely. Good morning, I said as I rose to greet her. She nodded in reply and shook my hand. Her shell's grip was strong, proving that she had used it to do plenty of work over the past six months. The leather clothing her shell was wearing looked like it had been freshly oiled and cleaned, and her face and hair had been washed and groomed. I wondered if she had put in the extra effort to impress me. I smiled as I recalled spending a bit more time in the shower myself this morning. There was no lack of vanity between the two of us, it seemed. This house and yard are amazing. It looks like authentic construction, she exclaimed. It's pretty close. There are a few differences, though. I doubt my original house would still be standing after a century and a half here on the prairie. She spent a bit of time fussing over the exterior details of the porch and the house. After a bit, I asked, where do you want to start, the barn or the house? Let's check out the barn first, she replied. We spent almost an hour in the lower level of the barn. I began to open up and enjoyed sharing the history of many of the items on display there. Reliving and relaying the stories of how I had been revived alone in the half-destroyed base, the rushed rescue mission in the aircraft, and other more recent stories of when I resided here felt surprisingly good. Chelsea was clearly enjoying my storytelling and explored everything with excitement. The morning was proving to be good for both of us. In between my stories, I learned a bit about her. She had recently turned 40 and was focused on her passion for history and acting. 
Before her Sioux reenactment project, she had spent a year living as a Pacific Islander. Before that, she had spent time in a group historical village with a few dozen like-minded fellow history buffs. The village was located in England and, and was still ongoing. From her descriptions of the place, I was reminded of Colonial Williamsburg, which I had once visited in my youth. When I mentioned that I was impressed with her determination to experience history by living it, she beamed. Most new humans filled their historical cravings in virtual by watching or experiencing one of the fully virtual simulations. To go and do it for real required dedication and grit. I was glad that the popularity of her broadcast was giving her the fame she deserved. We finished the tour of the barn with a quick stop up in the second floor Haymount exercise space. She tried the basketball court, and despite never having played the game before, I was surprised at how well she could dribble. Good hand-eye coordination due to her modern shell and her cranial augments, most likely. A few other games and exercises were tried before I came to the far end of the barn. There, on the large, flat surface of the end wall, a holographic projection started playing as we approached. It began by showing scenes from my life. I just stood there watching with my mouth open. I had no idea that this display was had been produced or was now here. When I got to scenes of my more recent family, I had to look away. Chelsea said that we could stop watching if I wished. She had seen the video before in virtual and wanted to spare me having to finish watching it with her. Apparently someone had created the video when I had dropped off the grid, so to speak. I recovered somewhat on our walk back to the house, although we walked in silence. The house tour went better. She asked a bunch of questions about the house and what it was like to have lived here, both in times past and more recently. When I showed her the bathroom, I noticed her staring longingly at the shower. I laughed and asked if she wanted to use it while she was here. Oh God, John, could I? It's been six months since I have had a decent hot shower. I've been to the visitor's annex over at the field base a few times, but that place is not private like this, and I did not want to risk grabbing a shower there and expose my weakness to my fans. I just laughed and showed her where the extra towels were. Since it was almost noon, I asked her what she wanted for lunch. I swear I saw her dusky shell blush as she sheepishly asked if my replicator could whip up a pepperoni pizza and a chocolate milkshake. I just laughed some more and nodded, leaving her to enjoy her shower. I would not tell her historical fans that she was taking a break from realism for a few hours. The pizza and milkshakes were great. I never admitted that I had been missing and craving both as much as she had been. After we had finished stuffing ourselves, I led her back outside. She thanked me profusely for the tour, the meal, and the use of my shower. As she mounted her male shell on the back of the Neo horse, she thanked me again a second time. She also asked me if she could expect me to visit her camp again. I thought about it. The buggy could get me there much faster now that the trail had been mapped. I nodded that maybe I would do that in a day or two. I watched Chelsea and her horse clip-clop away and disappear over the hill. Today had been fun, more fun than I had expected. I had not realized how much I had missed human company and conversation.